Good morning, guys. Hey, take your Bibles out, turn to Numbers chapter 11, Numbers 11, starting in verse 1. Numbers 11, starting in verse 1. If you do not have a Bible, we have some hardback black ones available for you to have on the back table. Consider that our gift to you, Numbers 11. We're continuing in our series through the book of Numbers, and um, as you are turning there, uh, I want you to be thinking of somebody in your life that you know who is always cheerful. Uh, A person who you know uh, always views life uh, like a glass half full and not half empty. Uh, In short, be thinking of someone who is an optimist. Do any of you know any optimists in your life? Raise your hand if you know some optimists. Yes, wonderful. I know I know a few optimists. In fact, when when I was uh, first getting to know my wife, one of the original things that jumped out to me about her outside of her dashingly good looks was her optimistic spirit. She had something about her that was just a palpable joy about her, an optimism, an outlook on life that I found to be very, very, very uh, attractive, and still to this day, it's attractive as well. Think of somebody who always has a genuine smile on their face, Uh, someone who is able to find something good in the middle of a not-so-good situation. Uh, When we know an optimist, uh, somebody who's an optimistic person, that's a real treasure. That's a type of person that we need to value greatly in our lives. It's a type of person that hopefully we are. In fact, did you know that the world today would look a lot different if it wasn't for one very stubborn optimist? Uh, Many of us are familiar with who Winston Churchill is. Winston Churchill was the prime minister of England during uh, World War II, during Hitler's reign. And when we think of Winston Churchill, you might think of a tough, gruff, grumpy, kind of austere-looking Brit, you know? A tough guy who would stare Hitler right in the face, not flinch, not give an inch. Just a tough kind of guy with a massive unbreakable bravado about him, but perhaps one of Winston Churchill's greatest ability is that he was always able to find something to be optimistic about. He was always able to find something good, literally in the midst of the rubble in his country. Winston Churchill famously said, he said, the optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. It does not seem too much sense or too much use being anything else. Do you know of anyone who has this kind of spirit? This kind of optimistic view in the way the world works, it doesn't seem to be really anything else. Well, did you know that the Bible has quite a bit to say about this kind of spirit, about this kind of disposition in life? The book of Proverbs has quite a bit to say on this. Proverbs 15, 13 says that a joyful heart makes a cheerful countenance, but sorrow of the heart crushes the spirit. Proverbs 16, 24 says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, We've been getting this farm fresh honey recently, Maddie and I, and so this hits home for me. It is so good. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 17, 22 says, a cheerful heart is good medicine. You don't need an ibuprofen. It's a cheerful heart, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. That's not medical advice, by the way. If you need to take an ibuprofen, go ahead. And then Proverbs 18, 14 says, the spirit of a man can endure his sickness, but who can survive a broken spirit? If you've ever been around an optimistic person or a cheerful person, you know firsthand, listen to me, that optimism is contagious. You know that. You know that it is incredibly contagious because there is something about an optimistic and a cheerful person that is just palpable. You just can't escape it. Whether it be their disposition on life or just the way in which they view uh, circumstances, it is contagious. In fact, did you know that in World War II, after the city of London would suffer terrible bombing attacks by the hands of the Germans, the entire night the city would go quiet, it would go still, and it would appear to be completely lifeless. Not much sound would be made, but as the sun would rise, so too the people would rise and they would turn on their radio frequency and they would hear their stubborn, optimistic leader, Winston Churchill, address the city. And they would hear him do it time and time and time and time again after every single bombing barrage that they would endure. And somehow, these people were able to rally time and time again, not one time, not two times, not three times, 48 times over and over and over again. It's because the optimistic spirit of a leader is contagious. You can't help but feel it. You can't help but be changed by it. But do you want to know what else is contagious? Perhaps what is even more contagious is the opposite of optimism. Grumbling, complaining, 
a pessimistic attitude, anxiety, hurtful talk, hurtful self-talk, fear, and so much more. And unfortunately, the reality for us today in this day and age is that our world and our culture is not led with the disposition of that of a Churchill, not led with the disposition of optimism. Instead, the culture we are living in is a culture that is widely crafted through fear, worries, complaining about everything, hurtful talk, and just an overall sense of anxiety. And as Christians, listen to me, this is very important. If you're a Christian in this room, it's very important that you realize that you are not immune to the mind virus of this age. We are not immune to the mind virus of this age. This spirit of the day absorbs into our very bodies, and you know it begins to change the way we view everything. And if you are someone here who has been infected with this way of thinking, with this way of processing information, and this way of living life, listen to me, I love you enough to tell you that your addiction to grumbling, your hankering for complaining, is damaging the way you live your life, and even more than that, it breaks the heart of God and it's sinful. It's sinful. Now, many of us probably don't think about this in this way, right? Grumbling, complaining is sinful, probably not. Maybe when we think of big sins, we might go to the seven deadly sins, right? Lust, that's a no-no. Gluttony, that's one we don't talk about in America because you're gonna tick a lot of people off. Lay off the Oreos, can't say that. Greed, laziness, wrath, envy, pride, Maybe this is where our mind goes when we think of sin, but it probably doesn't immediately go rushing to the thoughts that we have and the attitudes of our hearts when we're grumbling and complaining. But what we're gonna see in Numbers 11 today is that grumbling and complaining has consequences. It's very serious. It's very damaging. It's not only damaging to our soul, it's also damaging in the way in which we view the world and it's damaging other people. And even more than that, it's sinful and it breaks the heart of God. And so in your Bibles, you're at Numbers 11 right here. Just go ahead and turn maybe a page back and look at Numbers 10, verse 33. And I want to get us caught up as to where we are in this story. It says that the nation of Israel set out from the mountain. This is verse 33. They set out from the mountain of the Lord on a three-day journey with the Ark of the Lord's Covenant traveling ahead of them and those three days to seek a resting place for them. So we've been talking up until this point. The nation of Israel was, was camped at the foot of Mount Sinai and they were camped there for exactly a year. And here in Numbers 11, we see that they are officially three days on the road. They've packed up and they are three days into their journey heading towards the promised land. So now jump back to Numbers 11 and look at what verse 1 has to say. It says, Now the people began complaining openly before the Lord about hardship. When the Lord heard, his anger burned, and fire from the Lord blazed among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses and he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So that place was named Taberah because of the Lord's fire had blazed among them. Verse four. The riffraff, that's fun. The riffraff among them had a strong craving for other food. Get in line, right? And the Israelites wept again and said, who will feed us meat? We remember the free fish. We ate in Egypt along with the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone and there's nothing to look at but this manna. Let's pause here for a moment. We see two different examples of grumbling and complaining taking place in this passage. The first portion is verses one through three and it's sort of a cliff note version, right? The people are complaining, God responds with judgment, Moses prays and then they are saved. That place is called Tabura. It means blaze, literally God blazed. His anger burned. It was was a serious thing here. But then in verse four, we see more details about grumbling. And so here's what we're gonna do and here's how we're gonna spend a a portion of our time right now. We're gonna give you two observations about grumbling. These are just two observations from this text that I think are gonna be helpful for you and me to identify grumbling in our lives. Some, Some just helpful things. So here's number one. Grumbling begins on the outside. Grumbling begins on the outside. If you're taking notes, you need to write it down. Grumbling begins on the outside. Look at what verse four says. The riffraff among them had a strong craving for other food. Now, the question here is, who's the riffraff? Are we talking about the punk kids? 
Who are we talking about? Who's the riffraff here? Well, the riffraff was a group of people that sort of just jumped in and started joining the people of Israel on their journey to the promised land. That's who the riffraff is. This would have been fellow slaves that were in Egypt that just sort of jumped into the Exodus journey that the people of Israel did. This would have perhaps have been like Bedouins, people who are just traveling through the desert and saw this massive amount of three million people and said, you know what? There's power in numbers. I'm gonna jump in with them. And just started traveling along with them. In Exodus 12, 38, we see that these people are defined very clearly at the beginning of the Exodus journey. It says, a rabble of non-Israelites went with them. And they came with great flocks and herds of livestock. So a few things we need to know about this. These people were not a part of Israel. They were not a part of Israel. They just hitched their wagon to Israel. So this means very likely that these people did not believe in the God of Israel It means that they were not obedient to God's ways and they did not take seriously the commands that God put on the people of Israel. They were just along for the ride, brother. They were just along for the ride. Wherever we go, that's where we're gonna be. Well, here we see in this text that the complaining began with them. It started with the riffraff. It started with the people on the outside. In other words, Complaining and grumbling here in Numbers 11 began on the outskirts of the camp with the non-Israelites and eventually it worked its way closer and closer and closer all through the nation of Israel, eventually even infecting Moses. Which is what we actually see in verses 10 through 29 is that Moses was actually affected by this grumbling. Now, what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this? Look up at the screen. This is important. Here's what we can learn from this. Grumbling and complaining is a sin that you can catch from others, which means that we must be careful about who and how we spend our time. Are you hearing this? I need some head nods. Make sure we're following. I'm gonna read it again. Grumbling and complaining is a sin that you can catch from others, which means that we must be careful about who and how we spend our time. This is very, very, very important. Friends, did you know that emotional turmoil is contagious? Did you know that your emotional feelings are contagious? Here's one. Did you know that depression and anxiety spread like the flu. Did you know that? Don't take my word for it. In 2016, psychologist Ellen Hendrickson wrote an article, a very famous article, titled, Is Depression Contagious? And in this article, she cites multiple different studies, and I want to read one study to you. Here's what she found. A 2014 study of college roommates, researchers studied more than 100 pairs of newly assigned freshman roommates at move-in, and then again three and six months later. They examined, among other things, which those other things are very fascinating. We're not going to go into it today. The student's symptoms of depression and their tendency to ruminate, to sit in it, to stir. Their propensity to get tangled up in their feelings and to obsess about the causes and consequences of not feeling well. Well, sure enough, students who lived with a ruminating roommate also developed the tendency which greatly increased their own risk of depression. Now, to be clear, the depressive symptoms themselves weren't contagious, but the thinking styles were. After six months, look at this, freshmen who caught a ruminative way of thinking from their roommates had twice as many depressive symptoms as those who didn't pick up the thinking style. Depression, negative self-talk, these harmful habits, they're contagious. They're contagious. And Numbers 11 tells us that, listen, it starts from the outside and it works its way in. Let's ask the question, what are we letting into our life that is causing grumbling and complaining? That's the question. What are we letting into our life that is causing these sinful habits? What are we allowing to affect our souls? Is it trash TV? Is it those horribly, disgustingly dumb reality shows like the Kardashians where they sit around and complain about life is so hard when they're in Bora Bora with a Mai Tai in their hands in the sunshine? Give me a grip. Suck it up, buttercup. 
You wouldn't last on the Oregon Trail. Is it garbage music that has really nice rhythms, but the words are poison? Is it the friends we hang around that any time we get together, we just sit around and gossip about other people, about problems? Or what about when we get together and all we talk about is how the world stinks, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, nothing's good, everything's bad, there's no hope. Did you see the new headlines? Yeah, let me tell you, I just want to be in my farm out in Rogue River, keep to myself and not have anything to do with anybody because the world sure does stink. You better believe it does. You you guys know exactly what I'm talking about because we do this. What about maybe it's social media, right? For the younger generation, TikTok or Instagram and Facebook. For me, I don't think it's coincidental that rates of anxiety coincide eerily closely to the creation of the internet and the genesis of social media. It's just kind of funny. I don't know. People are getting more depressed, more emotionally insecure, and it's like, oh, whoa. Something called MySpace, Facebook, those things all coincide. I wonder if there's an issue. I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think it's called noticing a problem. So the question is, what are we letting into our life that is causing these sinful habits? That's something that you have to ask yourself. Because garbage in, garbage out. What are we letting in? In Numbers 11, we see that grumbling begins on the outside. We also see from Numbers 11, this is very important, that grumbling distorts reality. Grumbling distorts reality. Reality. Look back at verse 4. It says, The Israelites wept again and said, Who will feed us meat? We remember the free fish we ate in Egypt, along with the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. And look, this is not the riffraff saying this. This is the Israelites saying this. Remember the free fish? Remember the cucumbers? Remember the melons? Now, let's put this in perspective. Friends, it's been a year and three days since they were slaves in Egypt. Now, um, I'm not a historian, but all we have to do is rewind just very briefly back to the book of Exodus, and you'll see that life in Egypt was hell. Remember the Pharaoh was killing the firstborns? Remember Moses was saved when his mom put him in a basket? Remember that Pharaoh was marching through systematically, euthanizing, genocidal freak show, killing the children of Israel? Do you remember how the Pharaoh and other historical documents would take the women of Israel and do horribly wicked, detestable sexual things? Take the children, use them as sacrifices to demonic, evil, pagan gods in Egypt? Egypt was not a good place. It wasn't Shangri-La. They were slaves. It was a bad place to be in. But now here they are, a year and three days later, and they just want the free fish. Take me back to Egypt. I want a cucumber. I want a melon. Give me some leeks. I need to spice up a little. I want more onions. Are you kidding me? Do you see how grumbling distorts reality? These people are completely delusional. They're completely delusional. Everybody would have known someone who was treated horribly by the hands of the Egyptians, and they're like, let's go back to Egypt. I want some fish. And then look at what verse six says. It says, but now our appetite is gone and there's nothing to look at but this manna. I can just imagine everybody in the crowd going, oh, manna, dang it. Disgusting manna. I don't want any more manna. Yuck. Now, let's be fair here because we're Americans, right? Um, Eating something, eating the same thing every single day would kind of get annoying. Like, can you imagine eating rice and beans every day, all day for a year and three days? Like, that that would stink. Like, give me some salt, Right? Give me some fish. Give me some, I need something, right? Get me something. Rice and beans for an entire year would be pretty annoying. But folks, this is manna we're talking about. This is manna. This is not rice and beans. Now, what is manna? Manna was provided by God himself. It says that when the dew settled on the morning, the manna would be all over the ground and the people would go and pick it up. Verse seven, it says, the manna resembled coriander seed and its appearance was like that of bedulium. Bedulium. When I hear that word bedulium, my mind automatically goes Lord of the Rings elvish food. I don't know why. It's bedulium. Now, for you Bible scholars, you know that bedulium is mentioned early on in the Bible. In fact, we see it described surrounding the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, verse 12. Some scholars actually say that perhaps this stuff, bedulium, manna, was actually the primary food source of what Adam and Eve would have been eating. 
This would have been a staple along with everything else in the garden. Now, that's just conjecture, and we don't know for sure. But manna is described in the Bible as a yellowish, transparent gum resin that you could eat right off the ground. Or you could prepare it in a multitude of ways. Look at verse 8. It says, The people walked around and gathered it. They ground it on a pair of grinding stones or crushed it in mortar, then boiled it in a cooking pot and shaped it into cakes. It tasted like a pastry cooked with the finest oil. This is extra virgin olive oil, friends. This is not peanut oil. This is not safflower oil. This is extra virgin olive oil, baby, from Spain. Like, this is, I don't know if Spain has good olive oil, but maybe. <laughs> but this is, good, this is good stuff. Long story short, manna was not rice and beans. In fact, in one commentary I was reading, it said that manna, as described in this section, would have been the type of food that the ladies in camp and the dudes who love to cook would have been writing cookbooks about constantly, Right? Because it was so versatile. There's many different ways to cook this food. You know, you could grind it up, you could crush it, you could boil it, you could do so many things of it. A commentator was saying they would have had many different cookbooks, like 365 ways to cook your manna. <laughs> right? Manna in the pressure cooker. Air frying manna to perfection. Right? Julia Childs. No mess manna. Right? Like, America's test kitchen, manna perfected. Like, like, like this, we could do this all day. It's kind of fun. Like, <laughs> manna in the bread maker. I love that one, right? I'm trying to think of more. Anyways, we'll keep going. Bobby Souffle, I don't even know if that's a person. Bobby Flay, I don't know. But the point is, this manna was special. This manna was very special. It was a it was a beautiful thing that could be used for a variety of different concepts. They could throw in different herbs, use different salts, different fruits, products from the animals that they had. And this manna would have been something that they could have been so creative with that would have been a staple for them for many, 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 many years. But here they are complaining, saying they want a cucumber. And whining about, take me back to Egypt, put me in bondage, let me be a slave again, where my children are taken from me, my wives are violated, and my men are slaughtered. Listen to me and listen to me closely. When we are in the middle of complaining and grumbling, we must remember that our attitudes distort reality. Do you hear that? When we're in the middle of a pity party, when we're in the middle of grumbling and moaning and groaning about a situation, it is very easy to play the victim card when we are grumbling. It's really easy to forget the truth when we're getting emotional and caught up in our discomfort. So next time you find yourself moaning and groaning about your situation, about the hard times that you've fallen on, about the uncomfortable situation or circumstance, next time you find yourself complaining about your discomfort, listen to me, take a step back and remember that grumbling distorts reality. It distorts it. It puts lipstick on a pig. It distorts it completely. It dresses up a very ugly scene and justifies it in our twisted minds. It did for the people of Israel and it did for you and me. So those are two observations about grumbling. Grumbling begins on the outside, so guard what it is we let in. And number two, grumbling distorts reality. When you're in the middle of moaning and groaning about something, keep in mind that your reality is going to be distorted. So now that we've observed some of the obvious traits of grumbling, let's now turn our attention to the way in which God views grumbling. This is where we ought to be afraid not afraid. This is where we ought to be concerned. That's the right word. I'm going to call this God's view on grumbling. Three things I want us to notice here. Number one, God hears our grumbling. God hears our grumbling. From the very beginning of this chapter, we see that God is in tune with the grumbling of the people. Look at verse one. It says, the people began complaining openly before the Lord about hardship. Look at this. When the Lord heard, when the Lord heard, so God hears the grumbling and complaining of the people. You see, one of the tricks that we may fall into when we are in the middle of grumbling and complaining about our situation is believing that our attitude does not affect anyone. But that's not true. As we talked about earlier, our attitudes are contagious. Our attitudes will infect the people around us it affects us in ways that may be hard for us to understand. And then most of all, your grumbling is heard by God. Number two, God also hates our grumbling. God hates our grumbling. Look at verse 1b. It says, when the Lord heard, his anger burned. So God heard it, 
and his anger burned. Now, this is something that we're going to see on repeat all throughout Scripture, all throughout the book of Numbers in particular. As these people are journeying in the wilderness, we will see the same thing happen again. The formula goes something like this. Negativity slash grumbling plus God hearing equals God's anger. That's the formula, right? These people are negative, the grumblers, God hears it, and God's angry. It displeases him. We see this over and over and over again in the Bible. Now, at this point, when I was writing the sermon this week, I thought to myself, okay, I need to add a major caveat to this lesson because some of us may be misunderstanding what I'm getting at right now. Some of you might be thinking, okay, Austin, so does this mean that I can never feel bad feelings? Does this mean that when I'm going through something incredibly difficult in life, like the loss of a spouse, uncertainty about a job, the loss of a child, fear about a current situation, a relationship breaking up, does that mean that it is sinful for me to feel it? Does that mean that it's sinful for me to, 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 to pray to God about it? The answer is an emphatic no. It's a really good question, and I want to show us something that's, that's very important here. I, I, I want to share us the difference between something called grumbling and something called lamenting. Okay? Because there's a difference. Grumbling, not good. Lamenting, very good. So in your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10. Let's hear those sounds of the pages turning. 1 Corinthians 10, New Testament. 1 Corinthians 10. As you're turning there, Paul here is going to be describing this scene, essentially the Exodus story, he's talking about the people we're learning about. Here's what he says. Verse one. We're going down to verse 11. He says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Look at verse five. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Verse six. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. Verse 10, and do not grumble, as some of them did. I'm going to read that again. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. Verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So right here we see that what these people were doing was wrong. Paul's saying that. Their grumbling is not right. He says, they are an example to us of what not to do. They grumbled, they moaned, they groaned, they complained. Don't do that. But what's the difference between complaining and lamenting? Did you know that there's an entire book of the Bible that is dedicated to someone pretty much complaining to God for an entire book? It's called Lamentations. Lamentations, Lamentations. You get it? Lament, Lament, Lamentations. It's an entire book where the author is complaining, groaning before God. So what is the difference between grumbling and complaining? I want you to write this down. Grumbling is when our difficulties drive us away from the comfort and promises of God, whereas lamenting is when our difficulties drive us closer to the promises and comfort of God. That's a good distinction there. Grumbling is when our difficulties drive us away from the comfort and promises of God, whereas lamenting is when our difficulties drive us closer to the promises and comfort of God. Do you see the difference? 
Leave it up there, Nate, for a while so people can continue to write this. But, but grumbling, here's just a very literal way of thinking of this. Grumbling is when we raise our hands up in defiance and closed fists and we're, we're dang God, you are wicked, you're bad, you're mean, you're horrible, ah, just woe is me, punching the air type thing. That is what grumbling is, that anger, whereas lamenting has the same posture but a different mode of activation. Instead of hands clenched, punching the air, it's hands raised saying, God, bring me closer to you. It's not diminishing the pain of what you're going through. It's not diminishing the emotional turmoil that you're living in. What it's saying is, I need you close and I need you now and I'm gonna draw closer to you as much as I possibly can because the truth is is that you are the strong tower of refuge that I run to in times of trouble. You are a comfort to my soul. Your spirit will nurture me when I'm down. And so I don't wanna run away from you, God. I want you to bring me closer because that's where I will be whole. Now, I don't have time to go into a full sermon on how to lament, but I do want to give us four elements of what lamenting looks like, because I want to equip us, okay? We're doers of the word here at River Valley, Rogue River, all right? We're not just hearers, we're doers, dang it. And so here's what we're going to do. Uh, from Psalm 13, I spent some time in Psalm 13 this week. In your Bibles, if you write in your Bible, go to Psalm 13, and I want you to write this in the margins, okay? I want you to write how to lament, because I'm going to give us four ways to lament, four ways to lament, This is how you lament from Psalm 13. Number one, you turn to God. That's step one, right? You turn to God. That is the difference between grumbling and complaining and lamenting. The focus is towards, you you look at him. You turn to God. Every lament we see in the Bible is addressed to God. You gotta turn to him. Number two, you bring your request to him. Again, in the Bible, laments start with a clear request being brought to God. You bring your request to him. Now you don't just stop there. You ask boldly for help. That's number three. You ask boldly for help. In laments, there's oftentimes a desperate plea for help, whether it be for protection, whether it be for comfort, kindness, mercy, you name it. There's always a clear cry for help. God, help me. God, restore me. God, save me. God, renew me. There's a cry for help. And then number four, this is the hard one. It's a declaration of trust. It's a declaration of trust. Friends, this is when it gets difficult. This is when it gets difficult because it's one thing to turn to God. It's one thing to bring your request to God. It's one thing to ask boldly for help. But listen to me, it's another thing to discipline your heart, your mind, and your soul in trusting in God's plans and God's promises. That's hard. Because here's the thing, that is what you're gonna be holding on to when the situation, listen, gets worse. It's that trust. It's that resolve. It's that faith. Psalm 13 ends like this, but I have, after, 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 he's, after he's, he's bringing these requests, after he's, he's, he's asking boldly for help, after he's requesting of God, he says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I have trusted, I will sing, I will trust. It is hard, it is difficult, it's not easy. But I will trust in God. That's what lamenting looks like. It's vastly different than grumbling and complaining. Vastly different. So God hears our grumbling. Number two, God hates our grumbling. And then number three, God judges our grumbling. God judges our grumbling. In this chapter, the people start crying out for meat, right? We want meat, we want meat, we want meat. We want the free socialist fish that they had in Egypt, right? Um, we, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, I, I needed, I needed uh, a little bit of um, uh, humor in there after we talk about lamenting. You know, it's a little heavy. And we fast forward, look at verse 18. It says, verse 18, it says, tell the people, consecrate yourselves in readiness for tomorrow and you will eat meat. Friends, Okay, get, get your minds ready in here because what you're gonna read is a horrifying passage of scripture that ought to scare the you-know-what's out of us. Consecrate yourself in readiness for tomorrow and you will eat meat because you wept in the Lord's hearing. Who will feed us meat? We were better off in Egypt. Well, look at this. The Lord will give you meat and you will eat. 
You will eat, not for one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and it becomes nauseating to you (laughs) because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and wept before him. And why did we ever leave Egypt? Do you see what is happening in this passage? These people are complaining and grumbling about not having any meat and then look at what God does to them. Look at how God judges them. He gives them what they want. He gives them exactly what they want. He says, you want meat? I'll give you meat. In Romans 1, we see see this concept of God's judgment very clearly. In Romans 1, verse 21 through 25, if you're there, if if you're near there, go there. It's on the screen. Romans 1, 21 through 25 says this, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. So these people were sinning before God, but then look at verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual immorality for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than creator, who is forever praised, amen. Verse 24, look at what God does. Therefore, God said, you want sin? Have at it. He gave them over in their sinful desires. Friends, sometimes the most clear, the most devastating form of God's judgment, listen to me, is when he pulls his hands of protection away from us and says, fine, do what you want. You think meat's gonna fix all of your problems? You think meat is gonna make this journey perfect? You think that, 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 that your issue is gonna get fixed by this little detail? You are a mere mortal man. I am God. You don't know what you're asking for. So God pulls his hands off and says, fine, have all the meat you want. You're gonna hate it. It's gonna come out your nostrils. You're gonna get sick of it. Now listen to me. This is very important. We need to think very seriously about what we are grumbling and complaining about because, listen, who knows? God, in his judgment, might just give it to you. He might just give it to you. And listen, that's not God's mercy. That's God's judgment. So number one, God hears our grumbling. Number two, God hates our grumbling. And then number three, God judges our grumbling. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? Well, let's look at what our response ought to be. Number one, since God hears our grumbling, number one, we need to own it. We need to own it. We need to recognize it for what it is. It's not vetting, or it's not venting, it's sin. It's not just complaining, it's a habit. We need to have self-awareness, friends, and realize that as it turns out, you have a choice over your actions. This is something that doesn't get chatted all that much, but as it turns out, you actually do have the choice to respond in one way or another. Did you know that? God has given us faculties of reason. God has given us wisdom. And the cool thing is if you ask for it, he'll give it to you. He promises that in scripture. And you can make a choice on how you respond to bad things. You need to own it. Recognize it for what it is, that it's affecting your soul. Number two, if God hates our grumbling, therefore we need to stop it. We need to stop it. We not only need to recognize it, we need to stop it. We need to go in the other direction, right? You don't look at a mirror, see a disaster, and then walk away. No, you fix the problem. My hair's all funky. Well, fix your hair. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and discipline. Friends, there are faculties of wisdom, there are principles of wisdom that you have to apply to your life. We need to cultivate self-control. We need to cultivate discipline. 
When these, ne- listen to me, when these negative self-talk, these hurtful things keep popping up in our minds, when we keep calling ourselves a dumb person, a ridiculous individual, when we make a mistake and we lecture ourselves about how stupid we are, you take that thought captive and you say, no more. I'm not doing that. I'm not letting that mind virus affect my soul. I'm done. I'm not gonna grumble. I'm not gonna complain. Scripture says the closer you draw to God, the more you go near to him, you're gonna realize that you don't have a spirit of timidity. You have a spirit of power, love, and discipline. You have a responsibility. This is one of the things about modern psychology that kind of drives me up a wall is that oftentimes they tell you to kind of sit there back and just, okay, here, take this drug, take this thing, and then you're just gonna be fine. No, you have a responsibility to play. You have choices to make. You have culpability. You have the ability to look at an issue and make a decision on how you respond to it. Well, Austin, it's hard. I recognize that. Nobody said it's ever gonna be easy. But you need to own it. We need to stop it. And then number three, since God judges our grumbling, therefore we need to repent of it. We need to repent of it. We need to ask God to forgive us of this attitude of disbelief and sinfulness. Friends, repentance here is truly the key to this entire discussion. In fact, all throughout Numbers, we see that the people of God, after they grumble and complain, they repent of it, and God in his infinite grace forgives them, and he restores them. It would be very wise for us, if you're listening here today, and if you are somebody who who is a serial grumbler, If you're somebody in here who is a constant complainer, you need to repent of it. And listen to me, and if you're somebody in here who's unsure if you are this type of person, here's what you need to do. You need to ask somebody who's close to you if you are. Because you may not be aware of it, and if you're not self-aware enough to recognize your grumbling and complaining, odds are somebody else recognizes it. And then after they say, yes, you are, no, you aren't, Well then friends, you need to own it, you need to stop it, and you need to repent of it. You need to turn from it. Gotta go in the other direction, okay? And that could be uncomfortable for some of us. It's uncomfortable to be vulnerable about flaws in our life that have become comfortable over time, that become part of our psyche. But the good news for us is that God not only forgives the seven deadly sins, he also forgives our complaining. He also forgives our grumbling. So repent of that sin. Take up the practice of lamenting. When you're going through hardship, don't grumble and complain and pull yourself away from God. Take it before the Lord and lament and draw closer to God. And the beauty of the cross, and this is I was thinking about this this week, is that I want you to close your eyes right now. I want you to close your eyes and and I want you to picture Jesus on that cross right now. It's a bad scene. It's dark. Jesus is hanging there, his body beaten. It's bloody. And I want you to picture all of your biggest, worst failures and I want you to picture those sins hammered to that cross. Now I want you to picture this seemingly small, seemingly insignificant issue like grumbling and complaining and I want you to envision it being written down on a piece of wood and I want you to envision it just being hammered to that cross once and for all and recognize the reality of who Jesus is and what he did for you that day. Friends, he took that away from you. You do not have to proceed in this life with an attitude that is filled and littered by grumbling and complaining. It zaps you of your life. It zaps you of your vitality. I want you to see that Jesus in his forgiveness and Jesus in his love has removed that from you and that you can be set free from that. And it's very simple. You repent of it. You call on his name and you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my past failures. Forgive me of a grumbling spirit that has been so clear in my life. Renew me, restore me in the name of Jesus. I lay it before you. 
And the beauty of scripture, as Andrew led us through, is that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and he will cleanse you from your unrighteousness. He will save you. And so as Zach leads us back up here in song, I want you to just stay in this moment real quick. Confess that attitude, confess that failure. Maybe for some of you, you need to start taking accountability for it. You need to start realizing it for what it is that you're groaning and complaining is sinful and recognize who Jesus is and what he did for you that day when he was hanging on the cross and realize the freedom that is being offered to you in Jesus. And maybe there are others of us here today who don't know Jesus and, and have never accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Well, well, maybe today you're not only confessing your sin of grumbling and complaining, but you're confessing your lifestyle away from God, and you're saying, God, I need you now to save me holistically, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I want to be a Christian. I want to follow after you. Well, again, Scripture is clear that there is no sin too great to remove you from the grace of God and from the power of his love and the goodness that he has for you. And so I want to pray for us. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for Numbers 11. Thank you that these people constantly fail and they constantly get restored by you. Thank you, Lord, that, that Paul tells us that this is an example of what we ought not to do and that we should learn from their past failures so that we can pursue you in our lives headed towards righteousness, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We thank you that even when we complain, even when we grumble, even when we do it un righteously, Lord, that the salvation and the grace you have for us extends like a waterfall that will never run out. It's constantly raining down, constantly pouring over us. We thank you, Lord, that in our failures, you are perfect. We thank you, Lord, that even in our shortcomings, you make up for it. We thank you that you don't leave us in our pain. We thank you that you meet us there. We thank you that you are a home for the lost, that you are a refuge for the broken that you're a doctor for the sick. We thank you, Lord, that you restore us when it seems like it's impossible for us to ever be restored. We love you, Jesus, and we I pray over these people today, Lord. Take that sinfulness of grumbling, take that sinfulness of complaining away. May we be a people of lamenting. May we go before you and draw closer to you in our pain, and may you restore us and use us to share about your goodness, Lord, in our testimonies. We love you, Jesus, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said... Amen.